There are two basic types of strokes. One is what's called ischemic, meaning that there's no blood supply to that piece of the brain. If there's no blood supply, there's no oxygen. So that's an ischemic stroke. The oxygen content, uh, the oxygen supply to that part of the brain, has uh, that piece of brain tissue has been cut off. And that's about 90% of strokes. The other 10% is hemorrhagic. In hemorrhagic strokes, the blood vessel actually bursts and, it, and now you have blood um, and, uh, uh, everywhere. And, and these, are, these are, can be quite devastating. Um, both can be quite devastating. Uh, and and it, we, should, we should also remind ourselves that there's a third type of stroke. And, and both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes could, could be this. And that is that there are strokes that we never notice. Uh, I often go to brain cutting, which is a regular uh, event every week where the, um, at, at our, in our pathology department, where we look at the brains of people who have died in the past week. And uh, there are oftentimes non-symptomatic non non strokes, signs of non-symptomatic strokes and non-symptomatic tumors. So there are, these are what one would call incidental findings. So we don't see evidence of every stroke that occurs. Um, a large number of them are silent. Now, when, the, when there is a, a stroke, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, there is a core piece of the brain that's going to be dead. It's going to die, never to, become, never to come back again. We can't do anything about that. That's beyond... That's beyond anything, any treatment, any, uh, uh, any intervention that we can make. What we do worry about, what we concentrate all our efforts on, or what physicians concentrate all their efforts on, is the surround area, the area that is, is in danger of dying but is not dead. And that is called the penumbra. It's essentially the donut around the dead area. So the penumbra can be brought, can, can either die or not die, and what you want to do is bias the uh, outcome towards not die. And this can be done uh, through a variety of, of mechanisms. There's a macro mechanism, which is to decrease the pressure in the in, uh, intracranially. So a high intracranial pressure is not going to be conducive to, uh, to um, uh, survival. Uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll look at in a little bit. Um, uh, and also, there are more cellular uh, interventions that we can make to try and reduce the amount of inflammation that results from the stroke. So stroke is, is, uh, is a, something that kills cells. It makes cells sick. When cells get sick, they swell. They, they get larger, and this causes inflammation. The inflammation is going to be addressed by uh, natural processes such as reactive microglia, but it's not going to be uh, addressed ac adequately. And so a physician will go in there and give drugs that will help uh, reduce the, uh, the inflammation that results from a stroke. Now, the most common reason that we get an ischemic stroke is from an embolus. And an embolus is, uh, can be formed from an arthrosclerotic plaque. So you can throw off an embolus, or it can be a fat embolus. If, if for example, one breaks a bone, there's an embolus from, from the bone that can go in and actually lodge in a cerebral uh, vessel. And that just blocks off blood flow. The most common reason that we get uh, it, that we get a hemorrhagic stroke is uh, one of two reasons. One is what's called an arteriovenous malformation. And these are just silent, silently present in lots of people. And a lot of them are never going to blow, but when they're, when they're particularly tangled, the blood vessel uh, walls in these, in these AVMs, arteriovenous malformations, can be really, really thin. And any increase in pressure can just lead to a, a rupture and there's a hemorrhagic stroke. The other type of, uh, of uh, the other common cause of a hemorrhagic stroke is an aneurysm, typically a berry aneurysm. Now these berry aneurysms can be treated 
once they're found. Once again, just like the AVMs, they're typically asymptomatic before they're uh, before they they rupture. But you could have um, you could find it by looking at um, the brain for some other reason, and then it, there's an incidental finding. You see the Barry aneurysm. And at that point, what you want to do is you want to calculate what's the risk of that Barry aneurysm um, rupturing. And that risk, it, we, we have those data. We can calculate the risk based on the size of the aneurysm. So these, these let me just show you a, a picture of this. This is an aneurysm in the, uh, here's the internal carotid. It's uh, just at, at the base of the middle cerebral artery. And you can see that um, it, it, it looks like a, a little ball and that the blood vessel wall thins out. The bigger it is, the more it thins out. And so the likelihood of rupture increases and increases as the aneurysm gets larger. At the smallest size, the likelihood of rupture is the, or the risk of rupture is about 1% per year. But at the largest size, it can be up to, say, 50% each year. So if you, if you have a 50% chance, I think um, many people would choose to actually treat it. And there are two different ways that these uh, aneurysms can be treated. In one uh, preferred method, uh, there, it's not neurosurgery. It's a neuroradiological procedure where a coil is introduced from outside, from, say, the femoral artery and is wound up into the brain. And, and essentially, you fill this aneurysm up with a metal tangle of coil. And what that does is it allows the blood here something to fix onto and to coagulate. And so now this is simply filled with, with coagulated blood. It's offline, and when you redo an angiogram, you see that there's no blood flowing into the aneurysm. And so this may be thin-walled, but there's no blood flowing there, so it's fine. Now, some, uh, some aneurysms don't lend themselves to being coiled. And in those cases, there has to be the old-fashioned method, which is to take a clip and put it along the base of the aneurysm, that has to be done. And it has to be done through a neurosurgical approach. So it's a much bigger deal, um, but some aneurysms cannot be coiled. So there is a particularly um, moving story, in my opinion, uh, that Henry Marsh, who's an English neurosurgeon, uh, writes about in this, in this book called Do No Harm. And he talks about an individual who uh, needs to be clipped because her her aneurysm is not uh, is not won't take a, a, a coil. She needs to be clipped. He goes in there, and all manner of things go wrong. The clip won't close. The, they have to replace the clip. There are three uh, procedures, and it's it's a gripping story. In the end, it, it it comes out okay. But I think it's a really interesting story how he talks to this patient and presents her with the data so that she can make a choice as to whether she's going to get her aneurysm clipped or not. And then the, the, uh, the tension, the incredible tension of the neurosurgical procedure, because this is, this is not a minimally invasive procedure, and it's not a, a routine procedure. It can result in death. Um, and then um, it, it has a, sort of an amusing uh, ending where, uh, uh, where, where, where the, the patient and the neurosurgeon uh, have a chat together. Um, and I will leave it at that. But I, I highly recommend this book in general. Um, most of what Henry Marsh is treating here is, uh, is in relation to strokes, in relation to, to, to brain tumors, and, and so on. While the uh, cause of a stroke is cardiovascular, it's a, it's a failing in the cardiovascular system. Either an embolus is, is being thrown up and, and clogging up the artery, or there's um, a failure of the, of the vessel wall to stay intact. The consequence of it is all neurobiological. It de doesn't depend on whether it was caused by a fat embolus or a, um, a, a plaque embolus. It, it, 
absolutely doesn't matter. It matters where it lodges and what parts of the brain are affected. Stroke is one of the key conditions that n neurologists are faced with. It is, in fact, the most common condition that drives a neurological condition that drives a person to a hospital. I want to say one final word before we go on to specific uh, stroke syndromes, and that is, how do you know whether it's an ischemic stroke or, or an hemorrhagic stroke, and why does it make a difference? Well, the, the point, of, the, the fact is that it's pretty difficult to tell definitively whether something is an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. The one way that will definitively tell you that is to take an image. And that is why when there's a sudden loss of function, suggestive of a stroke, the person goes right away in for a, a CT scan to see whether this is hemorrhagic or ischemic. Why does it matter? Because if it's hemorrhagic, would you give an anticoagulant? Well, yes, you would. You want to break up that clot and get the blood flowing again. If it's hemorrhagic, would you give an anticoagulant? Not so much. You don't want more bleeding. You've got too much already. So it's a very important point. And right now, we don't have a, a fail-safe way of determining whether something is hemorrhagic or ischemic beyond taking a picture. That's, a, a, in my opinion, an area that is ripe for, for future innovation. Okay, so now we're going to go on to stroke syndromes.